Cheryl and Kenny. Yeah. It seemed that there was uh, a potential, uh, the interaction between you two presentations. Uh, I think Kenny said that he was sort of the anti-Cheryl. <laughs> but, but to be fair, I did say I hope Cheryl is correct. So. <laughs> yeah. Actually, let me just start off by allowing Cheryl, do you have any questions, to, <laughs> a question to ask Kenny about uh, particularly, or Kenny, vice versa between you two, particularly, so, yeah. yeah. So I actually don't think, Kenny, you're the anti Cheryl, because, you know, the reason the truck, the reason we have 3,700 partners in, in the program Smart Way is because they're saving money. They're saving $33 billion in fuel costs since the program started. And I don't, I shouldn't say this, but I really don't care what their motivation is. And for most of them, it is to save money. But I will say there was a 2016 McKenzie study that looked at the market value of consumer product companies that are publicly traded. And they found that 50% of the market value of these companies is based on their expected forward earnings. And one of the factors that matters in expected forward earnings is how these companies manage risk. And uh, there are an increasing number of, uh, of investor ranking schemes that take into account how companies are managing their ES&G risks. And this is why shippers are so keen to understand the scope three from their shipping operations because before it was a black box and now they can demonstrate yes we're saving this much carbon from the transportation part of our scope three and therefore we're protecting ourselves against this risk and that is sustainability which is good for the environment but it's also directly impacting the value of their bottom line and having come from the business world <laughs> specifically the trucking industry you know I totally get that and I actually in my view I think you can do both. Every time I go to a trucking conference, um, I hope there's no truck drivers here. So I'm gonna assume there's not. The trucking fleet, that I, the trucking fleet executives that I talk to tell us they would, there's one extra nut in their truck that they would like to remove. <laughs> because, because it's costing them a lot of money. And that is the labor cost that, that Kenny mentioned. So that's why I, I do think autonomous is coming. I completely agree it'll go probably for the, uh, the long haul first. And I can tell you that the industry is already, is already there in their aspirations. So I actually don't think we're that far yeah, apart. Yeah, no, I, I, I think we, <laughs> we, we would agree. And, 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 and uh, you know, to, to uh, uh, give kudos to the EPA, uh, you know, had, had had not clean air been a goal of you know for for trucking if you go back to say pre-1988 i think the average heavy truck in this country was getting uh somewhere between about five and a half and six miles per gallon in the in the average uh like midlife point on an engine was was somewhere 350,000 miles and and i think in large part because of the epa uh today that 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 midlife point for a heavy duty engines over a million miles and uh, and uh, the trucks that you can buy today are getting almost nine miles to the gallon so uh, uh, so so uh, you know a lot of uh, uh, good and heavy lifting done by the EPA so I yeah, I think I think Cheryl and I are on the same page uh, more often than that though I, I'm also sometimes called the anti Cheryl because my wife's name is Cheryl so it's, uh, <laughs> I can't do anything about that can you? <laughs> Uh, the, we have a question. Yeah, we have a question here from the from the audience. Yeah. Identify yourself and then ask the question. Sure. Uh, I'm Zane McDonald. I'm from S and P Global. I'm increasingly impressed by the influence that cities are having on the conversations we've been having here over the past two days. And so I was wondering, from a freight perspective, and and uh, in Lyft's case, moving people, how are companies going to future proof themselves? when we see cities expanding ultra low emission zones or banning ICEs, banning diesel, what are, uh, what are techniques that are being done now to implement and future proof and what are some strategies in the future that you think trucking companies might implement to, to cope? 
So, so I, I guess from my comments, and Cheryl, you, you can uh, you know, jump, in, jump in afterwards, but I think uh, you know, for medium duty vehicles, uh, I, I think uh, you know, for, for city delivery vehicles, you are gonna see a move to electricity. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, you can buy uh, a, a near zero uh, NOx emissions natural gas engine today. I realize that's, that's still an internal combustion engine and there, there's still carbon. So, so there are products available uh, in, in the marketplace today for, for that inner city move. Actually, I, I can, have a, uh, oh, sorry. I was just going to answer really quickly from our perspective and also on that first question. The reason we're doing electric vehicles is one, we care about the environment, but also to make money. Uh, we want to put more money back in the hands of our drivers with lower fuel cost. But it's also that risk hedge that was talked about is that it's very possible in the near future that a city might say all, all lift vehicles have to be electric. And what we would rather do is, is be getting there, you know, with our scalable program that can, that can work uh, and then meet the cities halfway and figure out, sure, here's a goal, here's how we work to it together, here's what we need. Because without the infrastructure in a city, we can't do it alone. So um, the EV program is largely to, to, to hedge against future risk. And I would also say there's a trend toward urbanization, the megacities, and there just isn't gonna, congestion's gonna be probably as much of a problem as, uh, as uh, environmental impacts. And so a lot of the, that's why, I, you know, I could have gone on if I had, you know, if Robert would have let me have more slides, <laughs> I could have gone on. But that's why Amazon is developing that multi-level, you know, beehive-looking drone delivery structure that they've got a patent on. And that's why UPS and FedEx are looking at drone truck strategies. Because they're, I think one of the answers will be multimodal freight solutions for within cities that don't necessarily require a truck pulling up to a building to deliver a package. That's a great point. Now, I just want to add something about, you know, when we're talking about within cities and, and some of these com competition for resources, really, to have good governance, you need some transparency, particularly around the data. So we're talking about how many uh, packages are picked up and dropped off at each curb, how many passengers may be picked up and dropped off. When you're talking in, in the city governance context, you, may, you need more information before you can start, you know, making policy decisions. And so, uh, I think John and others, there's a new consortium uh, called Shared Streets mm -hmm. that's sort of this idea of trying to collect data at the curb level to understand the movements of people and goods. Um, did, John, do you have anything? To yeah, add I'll just that? add that we are, that, so the, the, the curb project in Washington, D.C. will be the first time we, we do that along with Uber and along with Ford. Um, and then we're thinking through how do we get freight involved for, for round two of that. But yeah, shared streets is really exciting. I think it's going to allay a lot of these concerns of cities that they don't have the data while allaying our concern of, of PI, you know, private, personally identifiable information. So. Yeah. And I'll just add to that. Some cities are experimenting with things that they're calling livable streets, deliverable streets. It's kind of the same idea. And they're, in, they're implementing things like off-hour delivery of freight. So they're delivering at different hours when the when the people aren't around so they can minimize the congestion and they can also minimize the conflict between moving people and moving goods. So there's a lot of ideas and cities are leading, I agree. It's very exciting what's happening in cities. I have another question from the floor. Yeah, Tim Johnson with Corning. Um, can, can, can you help me uh, envision what a freight network will look like in 2030? Um, you know, we've kind of touched on it and this is a, providing a good lead into my question, but you know, what role will rail play? Uh, what role will uh, long haul truck play? Uh, getting goods from the port to the warehouse district and then from that district across the country or to local places, uh, the role of electricity and um, maybe fuel cell trucks, you know, just a general outline. All I've been hearing so far is hub and spoke. Well, I'm sorry, but that's what we have today. Will that change? And, um, and uh, you know, we've heard about drones. Uh, what, what is your view on what this freight delivery system will look like in 2030? So, well, so I'll take a crack at it. Um, I think there will be more multimodal. I think we will have an increased use of rail. I think we will have more short sea shipping. I think we will have more barges. I also think we will have things like drone, like Hyperloop. 
but I also think that they, we will start looking at the physical infrastructure of how we ship the goods themselves. There's a concept called the physical internet where you try to uh, use commonly shaped shipping containers and packages so that you can, uh, that are commonly shared, like chassis are now commonly shared at ports, so there's not, doesn't have to be a lot of back and forth within the port for trucks going to pick up the chassis that belongs to that shipping line. And so there will be these commonly shared shipping containers that are the sizes that can be optimally put in different uh, trucks and, and rail cars and on container ships. And that, that, that concept is called the physical internet. And I think that that will also help quite a bit because there's an awful lot of space that gets wasted and assets that don't get used right now within our freight system. But I think it's all silver bullets, Tim. I think we, everything, I think we have to look at everything. I've, I've seen some, I've read some things where they're talking about cantonary, but right now they're mostly talking about it um, in the context of local applications like at ports. I'll, I'll just add one thing, thing on that. I think a, a big consideration of, of, you know, kind of the future by 2030 comes down to the regulatory environment and, and, and certainly the Association of American Railroads uh, you know, especially if you're if you're thinking of, of uh, uh, long haul autonomous, where you're taking you know 40 plus percent out of the transportation costs for for trucking, one of the risks would be to see freight actually moving from the railroads to the trucking companies. And I would I would think that the Association of American Railroads is going to do. Uh, you know, historically they have done everything they can to impede trucking productivity. Uh, so if you give trucking a 40% a, a, a uh, plus discount uh, on their operating costs, uh, you know, the railroads will do everything they can to stop it. So, so it, it'll, it comes down to uh, what legislation looks like that allows trucking to, uh, to move into the future. Let's go to another question. Hi, I'm Alex Roloffs, um, and I'm just curious about the displaced um, long haul truck drivers and the current skill set that their careers have right now. And with if these trucks become more autonomous, you know, will you see maybe a spike in TNC drivers or just what your thoughts are on where their skill set might take them? So, so I, I guess I'll, I'll start on this one. So, so, uh, uh, you know, the way I would envision uh, yeah, an autonomous trucking, long haul trucking future is you would still have truckers, uh, actually physical drivers moving, you know, from the city uh, to a yard outside of the city where you would swap to an autonomous operation to run down the, the interstate. Uh, then you would have a driver on the other end. Uh, but, but certainly, uh, uh, you know, if you, you know, the, uh, the Economist had, a, had an article about, uh, probably about 18 months ago, it was about a 30 page uh, article on autonomous trucking and and you know you think of the the small towns in the west that are centered around truck stops and truck servicing so it's not just the truck drivers but uh, you know entire small cities that that could be uh, uh, wiped off the map because of autonomy and and you know the the I think the punchline in the uh, uh, auton or the uh, the economist uh, uh, article was was truck drivers have to pee so so uh, you know they they're they're going to stop every so often so so uh, you know certainly I think truck drivers like uh, you know like manufacturing workers and and uh, a lot of other uh, folks that have d been displaced in the U.S. economy uh, you know the the, the challenge is uh, you know do we uh, you know ignore them uh, broadly like we we have in the past or or uh, you know do we do something to address uh, the, the this you know disintermediation of yet another uh, industry away from uh, uh, low skilled workers. I'm also worried about that. Um, right now, however, we do have a trucking shortage, a truck driver shortage, uh, and the uh, most truck drivers tend to be older, and there's and it's really hard for trucking fleets to recruit younger drivers for a number of reasons. Uh, some of them have to do with how old you have to be to get your commercial driver license for a reasonable insurance costs, 
And so they lose that cohort of the 18 to 21 year olds. Uh, they end up going into the military or construction. Um, so it could solve a problem we have right now because the driver shortage right now is, rise, is increasing shipping costs right now. It's, it's in increasing shipping costs, which is increasing the cost of, of goods in the United States. But the, having said that, I agree. We will have to find something for, the, for those truck drivers to do, uh, the ones that are displaced in the future. And if I, I got just one more comment, if if if, uh, if if anybody wants to have fun, uh, uh, grab some demographic data and 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 uh, plot the number of 65-year-olds yes. and the number of 20-year-olds on on the uh, on the same graph, and you look at uh, U.S. workforce growth, and and actually Wells Fargo uh, was it was John Sylvia's last day at at, at the Wells Fargo shop, and uh, uh, they had a chart out that, that that said that U.S. workforce growth in the next five years is going to average 0.3 percent per year. Uh, so, so to, to just uh, reinforcing Cheryl's point that uh, uh, the, the truck driver or actually uh, the labor situation in the United States is not going to get better uh, anytime soon. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Miho Osawa. Um, I have a question regarding Class 8 trucks. Uh, because today, everybody is talking about the just EVs. And I understand that maybe for that light duty and the medium duty, EV might be um, potential um, solutions to uh, reduce the CO2. However, what about the class eight? Um, what do you think about the hydrogen fuel cell for the class eight? Because you know, uh, particularly, um, I'm kind of interested in um, uh, Nicola Mora's business you know, model, because, um, okay, uh, for EV, we don't know the grid, how dirty grid is. However, like Nicola Moras, you know, they mix everything in-house. You know, they make hydrogen uh, from renewable energy. So, you know, like for uh, class eight trucks, uh, what kind of, uh, I, sh I don't know if I can say ratio, but how the fuel cell truck is going to be penetrate the class eight truck in future? So, so I would say the one word answer is infrastructure. Uh, so so uh, right now, I, I, I think there's uh, something like five um, uh, fueling, hydrogen fueling stations in the United States right now, and they're, they're all uh, you know, in California, so uh, the opportunity for for hydrogen is is long haul freight because you, you have a lot more distance than you do with with uh, electric on on a, on a single fill up. Uh, so so uh, you know, without infrastructure, uh, you know, it's it's I think it's much like LNG uh, that you know CNG did a much better job in 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 gaining you know what market share it gained uh, because it was easier to to uh, uh, generate. Uh, CNG uh, it, it, it infrastructure uh, versus LNG infrastructure. And I think that's the, the that's the challenge uh, for for uh, Class Eight and and hydrogen. I agree. We need a low carbon infrastructure. Yeah, I think we have time for uh, one more question. Well, that was a um, I guess very relevant uh, question because I was going to ask something very similar, which is I was wondering how um, for John how Lyft thinks of. Uh, Basically, electric infrastructure and charging infrastructure. If if we're going to move mobility services towards an electrified fleet, yeah, that's a fantastic question and something we're we're grappling with right now. Uh, we just hired a few folks from Tesla, some pretty high-profile um, hires, including the person that built out the Tesla supercharge network. Um, so we're really thinking through it. That doesn't mean we are going to build a Lyft supercharge network, but we're starting to build up the the um, people in house to think through exactly how we do that, right? Because when we deploy 100 vehicles in a city, the existing infrastructure can support 100, not by much, by the way. You know, with 100 TNC vehicles, with 100 lift vehicles, uh, we're, going to ha we're going to fill up a lot of fast charge stations, which is good and bad. But then we need to st think about the next 1,000 and the next 10,000. So we're in the process of, of thinking through, you know, do we do it with the city? Do we do it with a utility? Do we do it with ChargePoint, EVgo, Green Lots? Do we, you know, we've had conversations with Electrify America. So right now, we don't know the answer to that, but we are hedging and, and trying to work with everyone in the space because we want that to be our limiting factor. Once we figure out the economic side of getting our drivers into EVs, we're going to be limited immediately by the availability of 50 kW and, and greater fast charge. And so 
to the extent that we can start s sowing those seeds that we can go quickly, we're, we're doing that and would love to work with folks in the room who have ideas of how we can uh, work together and do that because we do need to work together. We can't bear the sole cost of the country's charging infrastructure. So, I, so as you guys see, uh, everyone here, that you know there are true intersections at the uh, of people movement and goods movement. So I want to thank the panelists uh, for their ex sharing their expertise.